Welcome. Um, welcome to this session. Um, Sean Carland is going to talk to you about free APIs, um, the next generation. Um, and I'm your room monitor, and there'll be time for some questions at the end. Um, so get them ready. Thank you. All right. Hello, you all. <laughs> OK. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, so my name is Sean. I am a software engineer based out of Brooklyn. But beforehand, I lived in Somerville from 2015 to 2018. This is my fourth Libre, plan fourth Libre Planet, um, my second time speaking at Libre Planet. Um, this is a really special conference for me, a really special time of the year. So I'm Really excited to be able to share this with you all. Um, so I'm going to talk about a web application that I went to design. And this web application I was working on was to help efforts with canvassing for progressive political campaigns. So I'm going to go over a little bit of the technical details of this application, but certainly you don't need to have a technical background, so don't run out of the room quite yet or shut your browser. I promise that this talk will be enjoyable to everyone regardless of your technical experiences. So in order to make sure everyone is on the same page as we do this, we're going to have some big word alerts along the way. So. We're going to have a big word alert when there might be a topic that's going to be a little bit hairy um, that we can sort of break down piece by piece and approach it together. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about some of the technical implementations of this project I was working on. And then I'm going to talk about how I looked at my project and I how I audited the software I was planning on building to see is this free software or not? And specifically, what about web-based programming, API-based programming makes it free software or not? How does the program I am designing limit my user's freedoms? Because if I'm designing a program to help political uh, progressive campaigns, it would be kind of ironic to take away the freedoms of my users, is sort of what I felt. <laughs> um, so yeah, let's uh, go ahead and get started. So my story begins in the 2016 presidential elections. Um, myself, and I'm sure quite a few people in this room, were really disappointed by the outcome. Um, I was really scared about the direction that my country was going in and continues to go in. Um, so I made it a priority to do everything I could to help make things better. And for me, the biggest part of that was volunteering for the midterm elections. Um, I felt like it was going to be a critical inflection point for the United States future whether or not the Democrats would win back the House of Representatives. So fast forward about two years to last fall, the midterm elections were really kicking off, and I really wanted to help out. The problem, though, New York is fairly liberal. We're really not going to find any swing districts in New York to turn from Republican to Democrat. So I, I wasn't really sure what the best use of my time was. Um, I ended up messaging my friend Shauna, um, who's sitting back there. Hi, Shauna. Um, Shauna gave a great talk earlier today. Um, I sadly missed it because I was last minute rushing preparing for my talk. But um, if you didn't get to see it, um, it'll be posted online. I'm personally looking forward to uh, seeing her talk. But um, I talked to Shauna, and um, Shauna and I had conversations about the midterm elections and um, activism in general. And I said, what do you think would be the best use of my time? Clearly, we're not going to find a swing district in Brooklyn to flip. And so Shauna, or in um, New York, really, the elections are the primaries. As we saw, the primaries for Andrew Cuomo and Cynthia Nixon, because New York is always going to vote for the Democrat. Um, so Shauna directed me to Essex County. 
And Essex County is a county in northern New Jersey that overwhelmingly voted for Hillary Clinton 77% versus Donald Trump's 20%. However, the Republican incumbent, Rodney Freilandhausen, thank you, Freelandhausen. Um, I, I practiced saying that so many times for my talk, and I, I knew I was going to butcher it, so thank you, Shauna. Um, Rodney Freilandhausen? Freelandhausen, yes. <laughs> I'm glad we can laugh, because I'm pretty nervous up here. <laughs> I'm um, glad we're breaking the ice. So, yes, he won the seat, the Republican. But as you saw, the district overwhelmingly voted for Hillary Clinton. So I figured that this could be a really good use of my time. This could be a high potential district that we would be able to possibly swing from Republican to Democrat. And luckily, it was only a 30-minute bus ride from Penn Station, so it was very doable for me to get over there. I was working on Mikey Sherrill's campaign. Mikey Sherrill, I think the best way to describe her is in her own slogan, pilot, prosecutor, and parent. She went to the U.S. Naval Academy to become a pilot in the Army and then got her JD, I believe, from Georgetown to become the assistant district attorney for New Jersey and she's also the proud parent of four children. So I jumped on my bus and I went to her campaign headquarters, which um, when I went, they directed me to the town of Fairfield, New Jersey, which is located within Essex County. They gave me a list of addresses to um, stop by for door to door canvassing. So me and a, another volunteer set off to visit all of the addressees. And they gave them to us in a specific order. And this is the order that we ended up going in to hit each house. And as you can see, it's not really the most optimal way we could have approached this. We're sort of going in one direction, then another, skipping over some houses. Um, it, it wasn't very efficient. So I was thinking, what if we could optimize the amount of time for us to visit all these locations? Um, what if I could create a program that, given a series of addresses, could determine the optimal route to hit each address once and then return back to the original starting point? And spoiler alert, the engineers in this room or computer scientists might recognize this as the traveling salesperson problem, which is a famous problem in computer science that states, given a list of points and the distances between each pair of points, what is the shortest possible route that visits each city and returns to the origin point? There's a lot of applications with the traveling salesperson problem, such as mapping out logistical routes throughout the United States, or finding the optimal path to hit every Pokestop in Pokemon Go. <laughs> so there's a lot of very useful applications of this problem. And I thought, could we apply the traveling salesperson problem to hitting a series of addresses to optimize the number of houses that we could knock on doors? And so I ended up doing some hand calculations with the addresses I was given. And this was the optimal route I could find. And as you can see, we're not crossing all over the place like we are here. We have a much more efficient route this way. And so I realized that we could have saved seven minutes during our canvassing work. And that might not seem like a lot, but as you can see, if you do some math, if you have 20 canvassers, each saving seven minutes a day, working five days a week over six weeks, that's about three extra days of canvassing. And again, that might not seem like a lot, but elections in the United States are razor thin, especially in swing districts. We saw this during the Alaska House of Representatives district mum results, where Bart Liebon, the Republican, beat Catherine Dodge, the Democrat, by a single vote. And so this really gave me inspiration that with how razor thin these elections are, could my application tip an election towards a progressive candidate? And that's what really motivated me to do this work. 
Luckily, Mikey Sherrill ended up winning her uh, campaign against Jay Weber, and that district was flipped. And I'm super, super happy about this. Um, but certainly, I believe that for the best future of the United States, it is very critical that we elect Democrats to the House of Representatives and the Senate. So, sort of going over the general goals of this application. I want users to be able to send in a list of addresses to my application. I want to allow them to pick a specific starting point. And then I want to return to the users a list of addresses sorted in order for them to visit in order to optimize time. And this is a general description of how my application would work. Uh, the user would be using a computer and would give in a list of addresses. They would then hit my application's API with those addresses. And my application would use Google Maps' API to determine the distance between each pair of points. And once it has the distance between each pair of points, it would then calculate the optimal route and send those addresses back to the user. But before we go on too much further, big word alert. Application programming interface. An application programming interface is a set of subroutine definitions, communication protocols, and tools for building software. But that's not really a helpful definition. Sorry, Wikipedia. Um, so I think that the best way to describe this is just talking about the internet in general. We are more connected than ever. The OPT project right here, for example, is showing all the interconnected devices in the world. When we think about devices connected to the internet, we often think about things like a desktop computer or a mobile cell phone. But really, there are tons of different types of devices that can connect to the internet. Everything from your lamp to your fridge to your screwdriver, even to your blender, can all be connected to the internet. So we have tons and tons of devices all connected together. This is referred to commonly as the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is predicted to grow to over 75 billion devices by 2025. But how does it all work? When we have all of these different devices talking to each other, how does data get from point A to point B? So the way that you can sort of think about this model is we have three moving parts. We have the client, which could be your browser on your computer or your phone or your fridge, um, which is connecting to a server using the application programming interface. But this is still a little bit confusing. So I think a good analogy is when you were at a restaurant. Let's say that you are at a restaurant and you are ordering food, such as you are the client, and you're ordering food to the server. You don't directly talk to the chef themselves. Instead, you use a menu. So the clients order food by selecting an item on the menu, the interface. And then that request is sent to the chef through the waiter. The chef then cooks the food and gives it to the waiter, which gives it back to the client. Um, and I apologize that my slide's a little bit off. I admittedly originally used PowerPoint. I know I'm bad. <laughs> um, and so I had to switch to um, LibreOffice. But regardless, um, this is the sort of model. The diners don't need to know about the internal mechanics about how the food is made. They only need to know how to order things off of the menu. And so. Our client doesn't necessarily have to be a human. It can be another machine. It can be another application. So for example, websites like Grubhub or Seamless connect with restaurants, and they order things off of the menu, just like a human would. And those requests are sent to the chef. The chef makes the food. And it's sent back to um, the application. So what I'm trying to go at here is that you don't need, it doesn't need to be another human that's ordering from the menu. It can be another machine. 
And so we can think about a real life example. If I am booking a trip, um, I just got some tickets to Peru, I'm really excited. Um, when I was booking my trip to Peru, I put in information where I was going from and where I was going to, and if it was going to be a one trip or a round trip, or a one way round trip. I send that information to JetBlue's API, and then that information is sent to the JetBlue server. It does calculations to determine what tickets are available and the prices, and then it sends that information back to me as the user. But what if I was trying to build an aggregation website, that is take in data from multiple airlines and aggregate them together to find the cheapest prices? Well, it would work in the same way. My application would interface with other airlines' APIs it would send in the request to them, the information, um, like where we want to go, where we want to depart from. And then those APIs from the airlines would send that information back to my flight aggregator to determine what the cheapest flights are going to be. So going back to my application, we can see that my app is going to be connected, or my, um, my users are going to interface with my API. My application is going to interface with Google Maps' API and then send that information back to my user. So, you know, as I was doing all of this, I thought that this was a really great program, a really cool project for me to start working on. And I pulled out my laptop, I opened up a repository in GitHub. But before I wanted to continue any further, I wanted to determine is what I'm building free software. A lot of my understanding of free software um, was more related to hardware and desktop applications. Um, I never really thought about free software about web-based applications. And as I said, if I'm going to be creating software to help progressive campaigns, I want to make sure that I'm not limiting my users' freedoms. So you can see the definition of the four essential freedoms of free software. I won't go too much into them um, because I assume everyone who's in this room or is watching has some familiarity over the four essential freedoms, but you can check out the link provided in my slide below. So the first thing I did was I looked at the software that I was using to build my application. I picked Ruby on Rails as a backend framework I picked MySQL as a database, and I picked React.js to power my front end. And luckily, all of these technologies have free software licensing, so I was good. But I wanted to look a little bit more into React. And so React is a framework that is written in the JavaScript language we can sort of see a very quick diagram about how the UI would work on my application using React. The user would put in a series of addresses and they would hit submit. Those addresses would be sent to my server and then my server would calculate the, um, the optimal order of my addresses. But before we go on too much further, another big word alert. Frameworks and programming languages. A programming language is a vocabulary that developers use to build applications, to tell the software what to do, and how to do it, and when to do it. And so an example might be JavaScript. And a framework is the foundation on which software developers can build programs for specific functions. A framework is written in a programming language, and an example of this would be React. So when I write React code, it looks really pretty like in the top left-hand box. And even if you don't understand a single thing that's going on there, I'm sure you could notice that it would be a lot easier to read the upper left-hand code versus the bottom right-hand code. What's happening right here is the React code is getting transpiled into vanilla JavaScript code. And another big word alert, real quick, transpiling which is the process of taking the source code written in one language and rewriting it into another language. So when I write my React code and it gets run in the browser, it gets transpiled into vanilla JavaScript, like we can see here. And so this was one of the first 
stumbles that I had about ensuring that my software is free. And so, as you can see, I could provide the source code in the vanilla JavaScript, but that's impossible to read. How is someone supposed to know what is going on in their browser by trying to sift through this obscure JavaScript code? And that's why it was really important for me as I was planning on releasing the source code of my project to make sure I was releasing it in the original framework that it was written in and not a transpiled version that is really hard to read. So what's happening a lot with JavaScript is that when you are in your browser and you're on a website that has JavaScript, it's automatically run in your browser without your knowledge, without your consent, and without a way for you to understand what's going on. And so I'm sure as many people in this room can think about this, this is a blatant violation of our freedom of our software because we're having programs run on our computers without us knowing, we don't know how they work, and there's no warning to these programs running. An example of this that I find especially egregious is with Google Docs. When you open up Google Docs, a small one megabyte JavaScript file is automatically run in your browser without you knowing. And the JavaScript file is so small that you'll see methods that have a single character name. It's just literally impossible to read and the software is being run on your computer automatically. So I, when we think about JavaScript, we often think about fun animations like this that power our GeoCities websites. Um, you know, back in the day, was anyone else on GeoCities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's not what's happening with JavaScript today. JavaScript today performs a lot of non-trivial functions. And luckily, the Free Software Foundation has some guidelines and definitions of what a non-free JavaScript might look like. And I won't go too much into the details um, because it is a little bit technical. Um, and I did provide a link, it's kind of cut off, but if you Google the JavaScript trap uh, FSF, I'm sure you can find it, um, that gives a framework to help define what make, make a JavaScript uh, script trivial versus non-trivial. So the second step of me doing an audit about whether my software was free or not was to determine which scripts in my software were free and which ones weren't. Luckily, there's a really cool program you can use called Libre.js. And Libre.js can determine in your browser which scripts are trivial and which scripts are non-trivial. And so it turned out me using the React framework was non-trivial. As we saw before, my React code gets transpiled into vanilla JavaScript code, which gets run automatically in the user's browser. And it's doing more than just a simple fun uh, GeoCities animation. So the sort of next step as far as me making my software free software was removing React out of my stack. Now, if you're interested, you can protect yourself from JavaScripts being run in your browser automatically. In Google Chrome, you can go to Settings, Preferences, and click the Disable JavaScript button. And in Firefox, you can go into Options, Content, and unclick the Enable JavaScript button. So there are really great ways for us to protect ourselves and our machines from code being run without our consent. So I did some more research about what other ways could my application be infringing on the freedoms of my users. And I found a resource on the FSF website that was talking about the Java trap. And the Java trap, to give some context, big word alert, development kit. The Java trap involves the Java development kit. And a development kit is a series of tools, libraries, relevant documentation, code samples, processes, or guides that allow developers to create software applications on a specific platform. So there are two 
uh, primary uh, development kits, um, JDKs, Java development kits, that are being used by Java developers. They are OpenJDK and Oracle JDK. And the difference is that with Oracle's JDK, developers can use it freely in development and testing. However, if you use it in production, you must pay for it. OpenJDK is free software. You can use it in you can use it in development, you can use it in production, you can use it in testing. So OpenJDK is free software. So what is the Java trap? The Java trap is that for Oracle's JDK, you get updates and supports. But for OpenJDK, Oracle stopped providing new updates to past versions beyond Java JDK 10. And JDK, Oracle's JDK 10 provided a lot of really cool functionalities and tools to Java developers. But a lot of Java developers using the OpenJDK downloaded the um, JDK 10 because they assumed that, you know, I've always been using OpenJDK, I always keep downloading the new versions, everything's gonna be fine. However, as we just sort of said, the version 10 of JDK is not free. So a lot of Java developers will pull in JDK 10 and then use it in production and get a nasty phone call from Oracle's copyright um, enforcement team. This is important because Java is one of the most popular programming languages used today. The TOB index specifically rated Java as the most popular programming language used in March of 2019. So we can see why this might be important because let's say I as a developer am using OpenJDK. If I'm using OpenJDK, that means I can build free software. And this is an example um, of two free software projects that are using OpenJDK. Sake is an education platform, and Mahout is a platform that allows users to run scalable machine learning algorithms. So because OpenJDK respects your freedom and is free software, the users of OpenJDK can build free software off of it. However, if these users were to have switched to Oracle's JDK, their software would no longer be free. So you can almost see how there's a chain reaction going on here. Anything that's building off of non-free software cannot be free by definition. So if even more applications are being built off of Sakai or Mahout, and Sakai and Mahout are using Java's Oracle JDK, specifically if they decide to start using version 10, none of the programs that are built off of Sakai or Mahout can be free software. And other programs that built off of those programs can ever be free software. So this was the next consideration that I wanted to take into account for my application. The biggest problem that I had was Google Maps. So I was using Google Maps' API to calculate distances between two addresses. Um, I was using the Google Maps API to incorporate into my application to allow my users to use it. However, I did some looking into Google Maps' API um, licensing, and there are two things specifically that made me concerned. Um, Google Maps is, says that your API implementation must be accessible to the general public without charge and must not require fee-based subscription or other fee-based restricted access. That sounds good. However, the problem was that you must cons conspicuously display the power by Google attribution required by Google in the Maps' API. So as we can see, Google Maps is putting restriction on my software. I cannot use Google Maps freely. So therefore, no one of my application, my application can never be free software because I am beholden to Google Maps' terms and conditions. And even more importantly, 
Let's say that there was a progressive organization such as the Sunrise Movement, really, really cool program, definitely uh, check them out. Um, let's say that they wanted to use my program's API um, to develop more applications. Well, they wouldn't be able to develop free software off of my program because my program is using non-free software. And as we talked about earlier, the internet is more connected than ever. We have billions upon billions of devices interconnected using each other's APIs. So if one API has non-free licensing, none of the other APIs can build free software off of it. So it creates a pretty nasty chain reaction right here. So it was important for me to find an alternative to Google Maps to substitute so that my software could be free. And so the one that I found was Open Layers. And Open Layers is a free software um, implementation uh, that allows me to do the very similar function of given two addresses, determine what the shortest distance between them would be. So as you can see, I substituted out Google Maps with Open Layers. So since Open Layers is free software and protects your freedom, my application will now also be free because I am no longer beholden to a non-free licensing. And anyone building off of my application can now build free software. The next thing I looked into was how I was using Google Analytics. My plan was to use Google Analytics because I wanted to understand who was using my software. I wanted to know who my target audience was so I could best tailor my projects to my audience's needs, which sounds fair, right? We wanna make sure that our users of our programs are happy and we're building things that they want. Of course, this is a little bit creepy because Google Analytics is tracking users. Uh, if I were to use Google Analytics, then my application would be conspicuous, inconspicuously taking in information about my users without their consent, without their permission. And so this provides a really gross sort of surveillance on my users, which also would be infringing on their free software rights. So I ended up taking out Google Analytics from my design. The last thing I want to talk about was the licensing of this project that I was using. Um, I decided to go with the MIT licensing. Um, it's the one that I feel the most familiar with and because it is a free software license. However, I also wanted to include a caveat, which was you cannot use my program to benefit Republican candidates or the Republican Party committee because I didn't want to build software that was going to be used for evil, right? <laughs> like, if I'm spending all of this time designing this software, designing this program, I don't want people who I don't want to win to be using it, right? But I'm sure you can see the problem right here. I'm adding in a clause, a caveat to how my software can be used. I'm saying, well, you can use it in some situations, but you can't use it in others. And so adding that clause, unfortunately, makes my software not free. So I had to really balance off those twos. You know, do I prioritize how my application is being used, or do I prioritize who, do I prioritize the freedom of the users of my application? And I said, you know what, screw free software. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I had to remove that clause from my planned licensing, you know, because as I said, for me, it's more important to ensure that the software I am building will not infringe on the rights of my users rather than really enforcing that my software will only be used in ways that I want it to be used. So just wrapping up all of this, this was a really interesting process for me, especially looking through my web-based program to determine if it was free software. And these are the lessons I learned. Ensuring that your application provides free access to their APIs is critical for the development of free software. 
If you're using an API that's not free, no one can ever use your program freely. And since there are so many interconnected devices, it is easier for your software to get infected. As we saw Java's Oracle JDK infecting Sakai and infecting Mahout, which then would infect any other applications being used further down the chain. So to prevent it from infecting other people, you must take responsibility and do an audit for your integrations, like how I audited how Google Maps is integrating into my software. Um, it's not enough to just provide access to your code. You must provide it in the original framework that you wrote it in, and not a transpiled version that is obscured. And we saw that when I was looking at the React code versus the vanilla JavaScript code. A user could read my React code and understand it, but unless you're a super genius, which I'm certainly not, um, I don't think that there's a way for you to understand what's happening with the vanilla JavaScript code that's transpiled. And it's more important to protect a user's freedom rather than protecting how your application will be used. And this one was definitely a hard one for me. Um, as I talked about at the beginning of my talk, um, I still do feel a lot of concerns about the direction that the United States is going in. And though I feel really optimistic that we were able to flip the House of Representatives from Republican to Democrat, I'm still very worried about the 2020 election. And I do not want my software to tip the 2020 election in what I consider the wrong direction. However, by adding in these caveats to my software, I am restricting and infringing on my users' freedom of their software. So it's important that we still provide free access to our software and we respect the freedoms of our users and prioritize that beyond how our application will be used. So, questions? Yeah. So my, my question, if you don't know the answer, maybe somebody else in the room knows the answer. It's about the transpiled mm -hmm. JavaScript as opposed to um, JavaScript obfuscation. So yeah. if people really want to hide it, they'll do hex encoding of this stuff and you can't even read it unless you have some kind of you understand how to do the hex decoding. Mm -hmm. But the stuff that's simply, what you were showing there, the, the yeah. JavaScript, it seems that all they're doing is stripping out comments and eliminating white space. So I had always thought that there, somebody would have written a uh, program that would take that kind of JavaScript and then do pretty formatting so mm. you can like, read the function definitions and all that stuff and it becomes legible again. Does such a software not exist? Um, I don't know of one. Maybe um, someone else does, but that is a good point because um, there is a difference, right? I think um, what he was saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a difference between JavaScript that's been transpiled from you know, a framework to vanilla JavaScript versus someone writing that JavaScript to specifically make it very hard for you to read. Um, and a sort of example of that, and I talked about a little bit, was Google Docs. Google Docs specifically wrote their JavaScript to make it near impossible to read. Their method definitions would have like a single character. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I think that that would be a really cool program. Does anyone know of one that might exist? Yeah, there's a number of JavaScript um, sort of reverse decompilers. I think one problem will be that um, you can't always infer that they're trying to hide the source code. O often they are using short variable names just so it's minimized, just so it's optimized mm -hmm. over the wire. So we can't always assume that, that they don't want you to do it. It's just it's faster for the user. Mm -hmm. So take that. Um, the other problem is that um, reverse compilation, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. um, it depends what it's really doing in the first place. Like if it is just stripping out white space and stuff like that, that's one thing. But often um, the languages that are being compiled from have things like closures and um, other language features that can't automatically map back to the original um, language. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, there are some, but you're going to be somewhat limited. Yeah, um, and I think you made a good point that people don't necessarily write their JavaScript hard to read to make it hard to read on purpose. Um, but if you do provide JavaScript that's really hard to read, you know, there is a question of like, the, can the user possibly understand what's being executed in their browser? 
Um, it could be a really cool program to write. Maybe if there was more hours in a day, I could build it. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned uh, a couple times the idea of triviality, mm -hmm. uh, and I was wondering if that is like a free software term, because you were saying like, you know, there was the list of requirements mm -hmm. that was like, hey, it's trivial if it doesn't do this, if it does, then it's not. Can, can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, I only know a little bit. Um, I got that information from the free software um, foundations website. Um, so I, I don't know too, too much, um, but from my understanding, like a trivial or a non-trivial JavaScript is um, performing operations in your browser that isn't just like an animation or having something pop up, you know? It's um, manipulating the DOM, it's making requests to a server, um, so, like, just things that if you were a normal user, you wouldn't really understand what's going on. Um, I guess maybe that would be my definition. I don't know if I have a very, like, official one, but certainly there is information on the FSF website. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the question was, does anyone know... Um, I think it looks through license tags. Yeah, yeah. So the question was, like, does anyone know how... Yeah. The question was, um, like, how does LibreJS work? How does it... Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the question was... Um, like, how does LibreJS work? How is it detecting these things? And I believe that it is looking through the tags on the um, JavaScripts themselves. Developers can put in a specific tag in their um, pages to state that this is um, free JavaScript. Um, I almost actually put in the tag in my slide, but um, I figured that that wasn't necessary. Um, and I think it also tests um, you know, what is the JavaScript itself doing? Is it manipulating the DOM? Is it making um, AJAX requests? Um, I certainly don't know off of the top of my head, um, but it's certainly something that um, I will, I can look into, um, and I think I provided the URL for the LibreJS website, and if I didn't, you can uh, look it up yourself. Okay, yeah. just wanted to make sure. On a more practical yeah. way, what are you going to do with it now? Like, what's your next step? Um, yeah, so I'm going to start actually building it. Um, so I've done, like, a little bit of the uh, work. Um, a lot of my work right now is, like, designing, and I'm starting to um, build the scaffolding. I'm starting to build up the project. Um, but hopefully once I get to a point that I find um, is you know, meeting the minimal viable uh, requirements. I will deploy it. I will um, obviously open up the source code um, so we can read it. And I'll also make sure that users can run the program in their own browser to make sure that they have full freedom of the software. So um, yeah, my next steps would be to start building this out, start getting in contact with some progressive organizations such as the Sunrise Movement, um, if anyone knows other organizations that might benefit from this, my contact information was on the first slide, and we can certainly talk after words. Anyone else? All right, thank you all. I really appreciate it.